pick up at the bottom of Yud Cherem um, and um, and um, we start with um, um, Itmar. It, there's an asterisk near where it begins, about twenty lines from the bottom. From the bottom, the first words on the line are the Seder Puraniot. Um, okay, so Itmar. It was said. Um, it was taught. Rav Rebbe Chanina, debate of Rav and Rebbe Chanina. Some have it as Rafun and Rebbe Chanina. Um, Amri Bakla Megillat Ta'anit. The, the scroll of fasts is a nullified. Rebbe Yochan Rebbe Yosho Ben Levi Amri Lo Bakla Megillat Ta'anit. The scroll of fasts is not nullified. What is this Megillat Ta'anit? This is actually a very ancient document that dates from the Second Temple period, um, and it was listed all of the dates in which you do not fast, you're not allowed to fast, all of the minor uh, festivals that were decreed for the Jewish people, a lot of them related to things around the Temple, or things that occurred in the Hasmonean period. Um, Hanukkah is listed there, as we will see, as one of the things that are days that you do not fast. There are days that you do not fast and you cannot say a hespid, you cannot eulogize. Okay, and it's a, it's a really, a, 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 like I said, an ancient book from Samuel Tegel period that mentions it's of historical significance because it gives, you know, the reasons in a very brief half of a sentence. Don't, this day because of X. This day because this happened. This day because of that happened. But it actually gives some, you know, it gives some historical facts of things that happened um, in that period. Um, it is, um, you know, it's interesting, uh, just as jumping forward, I guess, about a thousand years, yeah, or more, more than a thousand years forward, um, there was, you know, in the Middle Ages, because there were so many wars that the, uh, you know, amongst all these various uh, nations, the, there was like the church made like a million of these tiny little minor holidays, saints' days and other holidays, and you weren't allowed to have war on those <laughs> holidays. <laughs> so they managed to like, uh, you know, try to limit the amount of days during the year that they that the, there could actually, they, they, the nations could be at war. But anyway, these were days that you could not fast or have a ta'anit. Um, and um, we actually have a very, you know, a uh, um, manuscript, I mean, not dating back to then, but we actually have um, the actual Megillat Ta'anit, as was, you know, copied over over, you know, over hundreds of years uh, in manuscripts. And there's, um, I had meant to bring in this current scholarly edition, I don't have it, but there's an excellent new scholarly edition by this uh, woman scholar, Vered Noam, in Israel. And in addition to the Megillat Ta'anit, there's parts called the Skolion, the Skolia, which are the, like, later um, 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 additions to it. And those were written, you know, somewhere in the Talmudic or post-Talmudic period and at times are like influenced um, by the Gemara's interpretation or discussion about it and uh, you know ours is one example so it's actually quite interesting because this isn't our topic now, it was the topic in Shabbos when we did my Hanukkah the Scolia, the Scolion of Gilat Ta'anit you know there are like two different um, 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 branches of the traditions of what that, those Scolia are and uh, the whole sort of Gemara story about the Neis Hanukkah and going in and finding the Shem and etc had like an influence on the later versions of those scoli and how they got sort of you know merged and hybrid made hybridized and rewritten and so on. But anyway, we do have these versions of Mikilat Ta'anit, both the basic version, which is very brief, here's the date, here's what happened, one sentence or half a sentence, and then the sort of later um, elaboration of it, um, which was written more in the uh, Talmudic and uh, post-Talmudic period. What's so the, the question the here, Vered Noam. So the um, so the uh, discussion here in the Gemara whether Butla Megillat Ta'anit is is are those days you know does, does the halachic status of those days remain? Are you still allowed to not allowed to fast and eulogize on those days? Since most of those holidays commemorated events in the Second Temple period that were connected to the Second Temple and ones that we certainly don't have any resonance in later generations, do those days remain considered minor holidays for this purpose? So let's take a look. Um, so it says like this: Rav Rabbi Chanina Amibat Migilat Tanit Hachi Kabar. So now going back to this discussion we had yesterday about not these about these five fast days, and it said these five fast days were fast days and they will be for rejoicing. So here's how to read the verse: Hachi Kabar. When there is peace, those things which have been fast days will turn into days of rejoicing. 
Ein shalom tzom, and when there's no peace, meaning in the time of the korban habayis, um, or we said before, maybe it even means at the time of oppression, there'll be fast days. Those are the five fast days as we know them. Bahanuch nami, and these days are also mentioned in Megillah Tanit. Kihani are just like this. After the korban habayis, they stop being days of rejoicing, and they become no longer have their status. Now, of course, it's a little bit ironic. It's a ba bad analogy because the five fast days started as fast days. The point is that paradoxically, at the time of the chor, at the time of there is a base hamikdash, they somehow become days of rejoicing. Even that's hard to get your head around. But somehow, I guess you could sort of see that they, you know, that the that 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 it's to sort of make a point. You know, these days have been terrible. They've been tragic. We're Destruction. Now we have sort of shown, you know, we have the last laugh. History has reversed itself. We now have a Beit Hamikdash. So somehow, you know, they become days of rejoicing. Fine, but when there's no Beit Hamikdash, they go back to their natural state. Their natural state is days of fast because they started as days of tragedy. Whereas the days in Mikilat Ta'anit started as days of rejoicing. So maybe they retain that status even when there's no Beit HaMikdash. So it is a very strange analogy. Since when there's no Beit HaMikdash, the fast days revert to being fast days. Similarly, these minor holidays lose their status when there is no Beit HaMikdash. That's the comparison. That's what, that's what Rav and Rabbi Hanina say. Rabbi Yochan, Rabbi Yosheb and Levi, I'm and Rabbi Yochan, Rabbi Yosheb and Levi disagree. They say, Lo Bat Mikilat HaMikdash. No, those fast days have not ceased having their status. Hanihu to Talina Rahmana Bivini Base Mikdash. It is the the um the, the fast days that the Torah says when there is a base of Mikdash become your days of rejoicing, and when not, revert. So their status as days of rejoicing is explicitly dependent on the presence of the Beit Mikdash. Aval Hanach, the other minor fast the other minor holidays, Kidakaini Kaimi. Their status is not dependent on there being a Beit HaMikdash. Even when there's no Beit HaMikdash, they retain their status. And again, an easier way to say that is, is that, as I said, that these fast days are fundamentally fast days. No Beit HaMikdash, they revert. The other days are fundamentally holidays. So even with no Beit HaMikdash, they retain their status as holidays. Okay, so comparing it to how the five fast days might change their status is a funny argument, but we have this basic issue of Butler, Megillah, Tanit, or Low Butler. So must be Rav Kahana. We'll get to that. Yes, we'll get to Kahana. Rav Kahana, Rav Kahana asks, Maisa begozmi ta'anit b'chana kabalud, b'lod. In Lod, they made, uh, there was a time where they actually said that there would have to, there would be a fast on Hanukkah. Maybe it was for rain, maybe it was for some other purpose. So they basically ignored the fact that Megillah Ta'anit says, you know, no fasting on those days, Hanukkah being one of those days. The Yared Rabbi Eliezer v'rachat Rabbi Yoshua v'siper, and Rabbi Eliezer went and he bathed. And Rabbi Yoshua went and he got a haircut. And they basically demonstrated in public that they do not recognize the fast. The Amulahem, and they said to the people who, who adopted a fast on Hanukkah, You need to now make a fast to do tshuva for having declared a fast day. Okay? <laughs> so they basically publicly rejected their uh, making a fast on Hanukkah. So you see, lo butlam gilat ta'anit. Okay, now by the way, you you know, before you say, oh, Hanukkah is different, okay, you know, the point is, take a look at Tosfos. Riyad Rebbe Eliezer Rachat, Tosfos says, Mas nisim dal kisei v'kmei Hanukkah, lo havi lelakshu. How about the fact that our Mishnah says that you still celebrate Hanukkah? Isn't that a proof that lo bat lamigilatani, we still celebrate Hanukkah? So Tosfos says, no. The laolam lechashiv yontav. A few hachi madliki neiru to take lene. So says no. You could still have lighting candles saying al hanisim, and you could still say bat lamigilatanis. Why? Because maybe you could still have a fast day on Hanukkah. Maybe you could still um, have a time, uh, you know, have a hespid on Megillah on Hanukkah. Bat lamigilatanit is whether that is a day has a status of a minor yuntiv to to disallow a fast and a hespid. So it does. So we could acknowledge that Hanukkah is still celebrated and still say it has no. It, it has no status from that perspective, and you're allowed to have a fast. So that's what they were doing. All right, that's what they were doing. They were showing, don't think, you know, in low they thought, yeah, it's Hanukkah, we'll light Neros, but we'll have a fast day. But when we on it, they said, no, low but when you get on it, you're not going to be allowed to have a fast day. Okay, but again, it's important to acknowledge that you can, that whether you have Hanukkah as a status of a day of Hadlakas Neros, etc., is independent of the question of its, of its, 
uh, Butler Megillah Tanit, of whether you're allowed to have a Tainus on it or not. Okay, so they went in and they demonstrated this. So Amr of Yosef, so don't you see that low butla, that, uh, excuse me, low butla, that you're not allowed to have fast days? Amr of Yosef, Shani Chanukah the Ika Mitzvah. Chanukah is different, and here he says he bridges that gap. Since there's a mitzvah of Hadlokas Neros, Chanukah will be the one thing that will retain its status, okay? But that doesn't mean that other things, um, that other things will, will, will uh, not lose their status. Amalei Abaye, so Abai said to him, I said, no, well, let's just wipe Chanukah off the books. If we wipe everything else off the books, why shouldn't we wipe Chanukah off the books? So meaning, acknowledging that it's doing the Hadlakas Neiros is part of it retaining its status, but as long as we're saying, why shouldn't we wipe the whole thing off the books? So Amr of Yosef, no, Shani Chanukah, I'm sorry, that's the blind. Eleanor of Yosef, Shani Chanukah, the Mirfus, the Mifarsing Nisa. Chanukah is different because it was a, the miracle was very public. Therefore, what? Again, that could just be a reason that it's not just technically that we do the mitzvah, you know, but maybe that it has particular weight because of the idea of how great the miracle was or because of our the value of Pirsu Nisa. We don't want to be Mivatalit. If you look at Rashi, Rashi talk, spoke, speaks more about these sort of, about these societal resistance to change. Rashi says, So Rashi says, not because of our desire to do Pirsumnes, or because of the weight of it, and therefore, objectively, we need to retain it. It's such an important day. But because it's so entrenched in society, it's not something that we want to work at reversing. Okay, so this is very interesting. The question of Butler, Lo Butler, Megillah Tanit, the first focus is the status of Hanukkah. And the question is, can actually um, we not have Hanukkah at all? Or at least if we're going to do a Tanit, allow the Tanit to override Hanukkah. Why is it, you know, and to override the mitzvah of Hanukkah? Why is it that Hanukkah retains its status of Butla Megillat Tanit? Um, and the answer is, A, there's a mitzvah and it's ritualized, and B, it's Mepharsim Nirsa, so there's this, all this weight and all this entrenchment of Hanukkah. So Hanukkah is not part of the discussion. Even if Butla Megillat Tanit not for Hanukkah, and you're not going to fast on Hanukkah. Okay, let's what, get back to the Gemara. I mean, right? I see, maybe anywhere we're talking about it, but I, it, 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 it in my memory. I thought there was like this time that they had a Gezerah, um, which was Son Gedalia, was it one of them? Uh, so you're very good. So let's keep on reading the Gemara. Okay, so <coughs> all right, so that's the issue. Do, do the things still have their status? Hanukkah clearly does, but that might be that Hanukkah is special. Mosi Varecha Barhuna. So Varecha Barhuna asks. But here's a line from Gilat Taanit. The plus of a Tishrei, but Tevit at the Karta means Daraya. On the third of Tishrei is one of the fast is one of these minor holidays because the god's name or the askara was was taken away was was negated from the shtarot and that sounds like a bad thing but that's the whole thing this gives you a feeling of what the text of Megillah Tanit is, is like two words for the dates betlat betishrei and four words for explaining what happened the telit at karta min shtaraya Okay, the, the mention of God's name was taken off of the Shtarot. So that's the whole thing. Then afterwards comes the explanation, and this line that we're now going to read in the Gemara is part of one of the as, of one of the scol yeah, scol scol the Ascolot, one of the scolia that are on the um that are it sounds like I'm talking about a, a Supreme Court justice. Yeah. Oh, that too. Anyway, okay, that's on the Megillah. So let's take a look, and now here's the explanation. It's interesting here, right? The later text is in Hebrew, but again, the earlier one, Megillah Tani. Was in the he was in Aramaic, it was the vernacular. Okay, Shagazram Mahut Yavan Gzerash, the Lola Askir Shem Shemaim, a Pihem, that the uh, that the um, uh, uh, Greek uh, kingdom, you know, the Hellenistic. Hellenistic, thank you, decreed that people could not mention God's name. You couldn't say God's name. Um, and a lot of the dates in Megillah Tanit are connected to the Hasmonean period. Um, so when the Hasmonean, um, you know, um, um, uh, were victorious over the uh, Hellenists, over the, over the Seleucids, so Hidkinushu Maskirim Shem Shemayim, they decreed that you should start saying God's name, you know, when you speak, Baruch Hashem, Baruch Hashem, and Afil Bishtarot, and even mentioning God's names in legal documents. And this is what would be written in these legal documents. In the year so and so, to Kohen, Yochanan, the high priest, to, to the Almighty God. 
So they would write Le'el Elyon in the documents. Um, mm -hmm. And when the sages heard of this, Amru, they said, What will happen? They'll write these in normal um, IOU documents, um, and somebody will pay up his debt, and then he'll be given back the document. And what will he do with the document? The, so, throw it away. He'll throw it away. Probably he'll first tear it up and throw it away. And so you'll have God's name in the garbage. Who beat Loom and they said no more writing God's names in secular documents. But also Yamasu Yamto. And that day they made it into a yanta because it's not easy to change entrenched practices, certainly not entrenched practices in the business world. So the fact that they were successful, they made it into a yanta. Now it's quite interesting that we have, you know, we do have things from that period, coins and, and documents and so on. And absolutely, and some of the coins actually do have, say, Liochan and Kohen Gadol. They don't, uh, I they don't think they say Le'el Oyon. Um, and um, nothing that we have found says Le'el Oyon. So, you know, mm -hmm. in everything, so something, ah, you see, it worked. So, <laughs> that's like the old joke, what are you doing? I'm keeping away zebras. Oh, look, it works, you know, so, all right. So anyway, but there are some interesting questions about, like, you know, about trying to historically root um, this type of a thing, because it's, uh, because it's, anyway, we, there's no evidence that they ever actually did write the Elohim in the document. Yes? We've seen it parallels with we having God, we trust in every coin. And, oh, right. And that those things get... Yes. On the ground that's, the there you go. Good point. That's and, right. But that's a recent. It would, they never the appeared in coins until the 1950s. Yeah. Right, very interesting. Go. What did you want to say? Was no? there any okay. objection to that? I don't know. Uh, because of that reason, probably more. You got objection from people. So, they, so, they, so they, they made the third of Tishrei a holiday because that was a day where they stopped including God's names in the documents, and that was an important religious. Not event. what I get taught in uh, <laughs> what three was about. Okay. Let's read what the Gemara says. Now, if you're assuming that Butler McGee so this is seen as being a later takana. This is at the time of the Hashemunayim period. There are ones that were even earlier than that. So the Gemara says that if they were, you know, negated, you know, um, you know, negated the earlier ones, why are they adding? Now, of course, again, when the Gemara thinks it was negated, it assumed it was negated after Chorban Habayas. So it's a very funny question, because the negation after that Chorban Habayas, this, the Gemara said, Gavram gavra Machut Chashmonai, right? But maybe it seems that Gavram Machut Chashmonai is when they started saying, you know, Shem Shemayim, Yochanan Kohen Gadol. Some reason the Gemara thinks that the removing of the Elohim happened much later than the Chashmonai period. It happened somehow, it thinks, in the post Chorban Habayas period. So the Gemara says is if they started, if they eliminated the whole Mikilat Ta'anit, what are they doing adding dates after the Chorban Abayas? So it gives an obvious answer. Who said it was after the Chorban Abayas? So the Gemara says, No, that happened when there was a Beis HaMikdash. But now we're going to see why the Gemara assumed it happened after Beis HaMikdash. Let's take a look. So it says the Gemara, top of Yotet Aleph, the tape clay, the Havili Yom Shenera Bogadaya Ben Achika. One minute. If it was after, if it was during, if it was post Chorban Abayas, I understand why you want to make the third of Tishrei into a holiday. Because post Chorban Abayas, what would the third of Tishrei be? It would be a fast day. Mm -hmm. It would be Tzom Gedalia. So then you'll have a need to make it into a holiday. That's why I was assuming this happened after Chorban Abayas. Mm -hmm. You're telling me it happened before Chorban Abayas. Who needs to make it into a holiday? Tzom Gedalia is already a holiday during the time of the Beis HaMikdash. Because what have we just said? Yulis Asono Lusimcha. That during the time of the Beis HaMikdash, the fast days are holidays. So how could this be during the Beis HaMikdash? Who needs to turn the third of Tishrei into a holiday? It's already a holiday because of Tzom Gedalia. you got to love the irony. It's a holiday. It's Tzom Gedalia during the time of the Beis HaMikdash. I keep I told you once that my brother was once at a Hasidic show on Tzom Gedalia, and they didn't say Tachanun because it was Gedalia's yurt site. So, <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so that's what the Gemara says here, okay? It's, 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 it's Tzom Gedalia. It's a holiday. Who needs to make it another holiday? So Amara, lo nitzucha el lesres shelefanav. No, by turning it into a Megillah Ta'anit holiday, not only is the day itself forbidden in fasting, but even the day prior, the day previous is forbidden in fasting. <laughs> so, the, well, okay, take a look. The Gemara says, <laughs> shelof, well, let's assume it was a one-day Rosh Hashanah. The Gemara says, <laughs> shelofan of nami, typically to have a yom shalach of Rosh Chodesh, 
Yechudah and Rosh Hashanah. The day, the, the day before <laughs> is the second of Tishrei. That's the day that follows Rosh Chodesh. So the same way a holiday impacts the day before, it impacts the day after. So since you don't fast, obviously, on Rosh Chodesh or Rosh Hashanah, you're not going to fast on the second of Tishrei either. So who needs to give special status to the third of Tishrei? He says, no. Rosh Chodesh get a rice of a rice of a little The status of Rosh Chodesh as a minor holiday is biblical, and therefore we don't strengthen it, and we would not have the impact on the day after it. So only because it's a rabbinic Megillah Ta'anit day on the third of Tishrei does that impact the day before the second of Tishrei. Again, assuming it's not a two-day Rosh Hashanah. To Tani, we turn to Brisa. Hayamim ha'elu ha'ktuvim b'Megillah Ta'anit. These days that are written Megillah Ta'anit, asurin bein lifnei and bein l'achareihen. They make for forbidden in fasting, Tosas has a long discussion about whether they also do this for their Hespid qualities, but for their fasting prohibitions, that applies to the days both before and after, things listed in Megillah Ta'anit. Shabbatot v'yamin tovim heim asurim lifneihem v'lachareihem mutarim. But on Shabbos and Yom Tov, you only can't fast on the day itself, but before and after you can. Ba hefresh bein zeh lezeh. What is the difference between one th- between these two? Halalu divrei Torah vein divrei Torah tzvichim chizuk. One is biblical and does not the status of the day and does not need strengthening, so it's only the day itself. Halalu divrei sofrim divrei sofrim tzvichim chizuk. The other is rabbinic and literally sofrim because it's Migilat Tanid. It was actually a very early scroll, right? It was called Migilat for a reason, even though it was a period of an oral tradition. The reason it's so brief and the reason it's in Aramaic was because it actually was written down. It was a, and it was a written and it was a scroll. So anyway, those need strength. And it applies to the day before and the after. I'm sorry, but I think you're not supposed okay. to pass the Yisrochah. So it's now, um, okay, that's presumably later. It's not in terms of, it's a good question, how exactly, I'd have to, I'll, I'll have to look about how, when that historically developed. So the Gemara says, <laughs> The Gemara says, I still don't get it. You, you said that this happened during the time there was a Beis HaMikdash. We said, when there was a base of Mikdash who needed to add it to to to, to, to Megillah Ta'anid, it was already a holiday because it was Tom Gedalia which had become a holiday, and you said to give status to the day before, but why wasn't there status to the day before on the basis of the fact that it was Tzom Gedalia? Same argument. It was already Tzom Gedalia. Tzom Gedalia was a holiday. That should have had the status of the day before as well. What did you gain by adding this as a special Megillah Ta'anid holiday? I could figure out one thing. Yes. How, how could it have been a holiday before the base of Mikdash was destroyed? I don't understand. Because the Pasuk says that it says, You live at Israel, Sasson, Lusimcha. When they came to rebuild the second Beit HaMikdash, the people asked, should we continue to fast on the fast days? And the Chayah said back to them, no, those days that were fast days will now be days of rejoicing. So now that there's a Beit HaMikdash, the five classic fast days that we have were days of rejoicing. So that's exactly the point. So Tzom Gedalia has now become a holiday. So why did you need to add a create a new holiday on the third of Tishrei? You had the holiday of Tzom Gedalia. You're talking about after Shivatzia. Yeah, the time of the second base of Mikdash. So he's been assassinated, and they're eating... At the end of the first base of Mikdash. Right. And now, you know, seven years Shibatia, later, you know, second base of Mikdash. And, and I just want to get a clear my mind, and they're having a Suda. Right. I mean, it's taking Yulis Sasson Limcha very literally. I know, it's completely ironic. Some Gedalia, let's see. Exactly. Okay, so the Gemara says, this Gemara is very funny, the way it takes that... It takes that extremely literally. <laughs> how about how about it's eating How about it's Tish How about it's Tish Let's eat. Okay. Anyway, they did that. no longer needing to remember. I know, but the fact that it Dafka is a holiday, not just it's a normal day. It's Dafka a holiday, right? That's the Gemara's point. That's t- certainly ironic. Anyway, the Gemara says like this: I don't get it. The whole question was: we were saying that this had to have happened. Um, we, we, we were questioning how this could have happened during the time of the Beis HaMikdash because it was already Tzom Gedalia, which was already a holiday, and you're telling me that, that, that it was to make the day before forbidden in, in, in Ta'anit. But uh, same question, if it was already Tzom Gedalia, then the day before should also have been forbidden. Says the Gemara says, Am Ravashi, Gedalia ben Achikam divei Kabbalah. No, Tzom Gedalia is based on Psukim, right? And therefore, Psukim in Nach, divei Kabbalah means Psukim in Nach, divei Kabbalah, divei and that's like biblical. And therefore, since it is based on biblical verses, maybe not Torah verses, but verses in Nach, so therefore, it would not make the day before it forbidden. So, Quite ironic, and I guess Tzom Gedalia becoming a holiday is based on the Pesukim in Zechariah. So here's the point again. 
Why did we have to make the third of Tishrei? The fact that we made the third of Tishrei a minor holiday, the Gemara assumes that's post Chorban, so that shows lo butlam gilatanit. It's still an active idea post Chorban. Unless says no, it's during the Chorban, uh, during the Beit Hamikdash. During the Beit Hamikdash, the third of Tishrei is already a holiday because some Gedali has become a holiday. And the answer is yes, it's a holiday, but because it's almost like a biblical holiday, a quasi biblical holiday, it doesn't need the strengthening of the day before. So by giving it another holiday status of this issue about the Shtarot and so on, that made it a rabbinic holiday, which also had the impact of the day before. Now, you could say that the very fact that we continue post Horban to celebrate, to celebrate, to commemorate some Gedalia maybe should prove Patlam Gilatani, because we're not retaining this holiday of the third of Tishrei. Well, anyway, as will come as no surprise, because you've never heard of any of these minor holidays in Tzbi Gilatani mm -hmm. other than Hanukkah, we do pass in Patlam Gilatani, okay? But so far, we have not yet proven it. Let's keep on going. Can I just say one thing? Yes. This is a, it seems like a huge halakhic principle here. Right. Give you a you know, right. Yeah, you know, the Gemara uses it, uses it uh, at its discretion. <laughs> okay, especially here, we're not talking about its real halachic weight, we're talking about whether we feel it needs chizuk or does not need chizuk. So something based on psukim. More like asmachta. Um, no. Is really more an issue of asmachta. Chizuk is a rabbinic sense about whether people will treat it weightily enough, and therefore do we have to reinforce it. So if it's based on psukim in the Torah, or even psukim in Tanakh, in Nach, then we know people will treat it weightily and we don't <coughs> feel a need to reinforce it, right? Whereas, whereas things that are purely rabbinic, we might have a greater need to reinforce. Okay, so the word says like, Masi Rav Tubi Bar Masna. So Rav Tubi Bar Masna asked, uh, here's another line from Megillah Ta'ani. Basim on the 28th in it. So what's it? No. Um, 28th is, uh, let me just see if Rashi, uh, Rashi says explicitly, yeah, Adar Kai, in Gilat This is from the Adar section, okay? So two days before Nisan, or a day or two before Nisan, okay? Um, so at least two days. Okay, on the 28th of Adar, Asas Besurta Tav Talihu Da'ai, a good report, the good report reached the Jews, the Yidun Mio Raisa, that they will not have to take themselves away from the Torah. Again, so that's the whole story. Six words. They got a report that they would not have to remove themselves from Torah. What, what happened exactly? So now comes the Hebrew um, gloss and ex that explains it. The Gazra Mahut the uh, you know, the government made an edict, Shaloya Askuba Torah, that they cannot learn Torah. We've heard about those edicts before. But Shaloya Maluat Benehem, and they should not do a Brit Milah, but she Halu Shabbatot, and they should violate Shabbat. Okay. Also, this is assumed to be sort of in the, uh, you know, in the uh, sort of, uh, um, well, it's not, not exactly clear exactly when. Is this in the in the Seleucid period? Is this in the Roman period? Okay, let's take a look. Ma'asa Yehuda ben Shamua v'chaverav. What did Yehuda ben Shamua and his friends do? Now, Yehuda ben Shamua yeah, is, po is post Chorban. Okay, which means it's end of the first century. Right. Uh, more and more middle of the second century. Okay, so this is going to be so this is going to be during the Roman period, and we know the Romans, right? Like the Hadrianic persecutions mm -hmm. and other persecutions, had these exact things about not learning Torah, not doing Brit Milah, and violating Shabbat. Right. Okay. Ho'chovenat lu eitzam ni matronisa, and here's again a Latin word, um, a matron. Mm -hmm. They went and they took advice from a matron achat, shekogdolei romi mutzin etzla, that all the important uh, Roman, you know, officers. Um, um, government officials are, uh, were found by her. Does that is that yeah, suggesting that she oh, right? Does that mean that she? Yeah, it's not exactly clear. I don't know. I haven't researched it, but I think that matronisa is normally not used in the context of of, of like a prostitute or whatever. It's used as a woman of important <laughs> social rank who who yeah. might bound the courtesan. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the way that women were treated in Rome was such that powerful men would always get to have their way with them. Even women of important political Even status? Even women who were so married to important political men. Interesting. It is shocking how common that was. Really? Okay, so maybe they're both true then. A yeah, woman of important yeah. status, but it might also mean that men were by her for political, for sexual favors yeah. or demands. Okay, so anyway, she had a lot of influence, presumably, on these men. <coughs> and they said to her, what should we do? 
Amalahem, she said to them, Bo vivkinu belaila, go and do a make a protest at night. Okay. So why exactly night? Hafkana, my why you know what you know why at night? Because at night like the sounds are heard longer or maybe it's a little bit more impactful to it's hear. Safer. It's to, dangerous during the day to demonstrate. Uh, maybe yeah. the archers can't see him as well. Maybe, but maybe also maybe also the sound like you know, the sense of the power of the crowd feels greater at night. So they have their own little Tiananmen Square. So <laughs> they went and they protested at night. Um, Amru, and they said, Eishamayim, which is like L'shein um, Shamayim, the name of heaven. Um, are we not your brethren? Right, I guess, because, again, Esav is, uh, you know, brother of Yaakov. We have the same father. Yaakov, so we act, uh, we, uh, you know, we have the same mother, Rivka. Um, why have we been treated differently than all other nations? That you make these bad, you know, these evil edicts against us. Because in general, it's true, you know, Rome and uh, the Seleucids before them tended to be pretty tolerant. Of course, they were tolerant as long as you recognized their gods, then you could keep on doing your own religion. If you were people that were constantly rebelling and that you were people that also refused to recognize their gods, you know, their toleration might have worn a little bit thin. But never. Put, they put a statue of your god in their pantheon. Exactly. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, okay. Ubi Lum, but somehow that was effective. Maybe this woman sort of exerted her influence as well. The Osro Yom Asu Yom Tov, and that day was the So, again, it's so funny, like the difference of the days. One day was a Yom Tov because of, uh, they took the name of God out of Starod. Another day was a Yom Tov because basically there was this terrible, horrific decree from the uh, Roman government, which God was going to try to basically, you know, uh, drive everybody from religion and no Brit Milah, no Shabbos, and no Torah, and that got done away with. That's also a Yom Tov. Okay, anyway, like, very different significance, I would say. Anyway, all right, so now we have the 28th of Adar was a Yom Tov. So now let's figure out what we can infer from this. The Isa could I take but Lami Gilat Ta'ani, the Nifi Gilat Ta'ani was an old Kamaisa Batulach when Isa Mosifin, if they are already stopped at the Chorban Abayis, you know, using it, and negate, you know, negated the status of all those holidays. What are they doing post Chorban? Because Yehuda ben Shammu is post Chorban. What are they doing post Chorban? Adding to the list. The fact that they're adding to it post Chorban shows that it's still active. Now, of course, the answer about all of these might be maybe they were mevatel megillat taanit post Chorban, not mm -hmm. after Chorban. But Gemara assumes, based on the psukim of Yulis Asom Simcha, that the Chor the Chorban changes the status from Yontif to non Yontif, or from Yontif to Tanit. That if it was Butla, it was Butla after Chorban. So says, you see, it's not Butla. They're adding days even after the Chorban. So the Gemara says, and if you want to say, you want to claim this is when there was a base on Mikdash, so it can't be. Yehuda ben Shemur was a student of Rabbi Meir, and Rabbi Meir was a student of, um, you know, of, uh, what do you call it, of, um, of Rabbi Akiva. So that was like in the middle to end of the second century. Rabbi Meir was after this. How do you know? Did not, we taught in Mishnah, how do you know that Yehuda ben Shamua was a student of Rabbi Meir? Not how you know Rabbi Meir was later. We know, obviously, Rabbi Meir was post Horban. Now we turn to Mishnah. You have a, a, a glass vessel that has a puncture in it, a hole in it, and you fill that hole with lead. Um, you, know, you have the whole, you know, that's why there was a lot of lead poisoning in yeah. the uh, ancient days. Okay, <laughs> so they filled it with lead. Amar Rav Shmuel so Rav Shmuel says Yehuda ben Shamua mitamein shum Rebbe Meir. Yehuda ben Shamua says it's tamein in the name of Rebbe Meir. The Chachamim mitahari, but the Chachamim say it's tahor. So the whole point of bringing that in was to show you that Yehuda ben Shamua was a student of Rebbe Meir. He said something in the name of Rebbe Meir. Now, what does it mean he was mitamein? So there's a whole long Rashi in terms of trying to figure it out. The simpler answer, simpler answer so that Rashi has is is that uh, uh, glass vessels are only mitame rabbinically. Biblically, there's no tuman glass vessels. Metal vessels are mitame biblically. So if you have a glass vessel that stops being functional because it has a hole in it, and you make it functional again by filling it with metal, yeah. then it has a status of a metal vessel, and it is biblically tame. Or the chachamim say, no, it is only a glass vessel. You know, Tosis is bothered that then it wouldn't say chachamim mitaharim, because then all they're really debating is whether it's biblical or rabbinic. Okay, but nevertheless, 
less, and there are a couple other possible reads of this, but we'll stick with that read. What's okay? really going on? Does Suttai or Sutya, they're concerned with whether um, the Girat Anit is a Bar Samcha or not? No, we, we know that it was always, that it was affected for a long period of time. The question is, do the dates remain in effect and retain their halakhic status after Korban Abayas? Or do we say that it was, that it was Batla? That a period came, they said, most of these dates connect to historical events at the time of the Beis HaMikdash, you know, and uh, that's ancient history at this stage. You know, either, it, either it's been overridden because, you know, we've got a Horban, so that like wipes the slate clean, or it's too much of a distant memory, so they lose their status. Oh, so there's a theological implication well, for framing the time of the Horban as, so to speak, ancient, no longer applicable, well, that was, in a new period. Okay, that was the way I said it. The Gemara never gives the exact reason. I mean, the Gemara does I'm tie it in. For, yeah. yeah, the Gemara does tie it into this Pasuk of when there's when there's a Shalom, then it's Sason and Simcha, and when there's not a Shalom, it's Sason. <laughs> So yes, presumably in a post Horban period, in a period of Galut, then the joy that these days retain loses their power, right? So, you know, in the Galut reality, that seems to be the idea behind this. Okay, but anyway, what do you see? You see that they were still using it in the post Horban period, in the time of Yehuda ben Tavai. So you see Lobatlu, because they were still using it. So the says Tanai, it's a debate of Tanayim, whether it was still in use uh, post Horban. The Tanyu, we taught in the Brisa, Hayamima Elu Haksivim Bim Gilatani, the days listed in Gilatani, Bemis Manche Beta Mikdash Kayam, Bemis Manche Beta Mikdash Kayam, Asurim, Divi Rebbe Meir. So very interesting. Rebbe Meir says they retained their status, and they're even after the Korban Abayas. Now it works. Yehuda ben Shemuel was a student of Rebbe Meir. It works out beautifully. So Rebbe Meir's student was adding to those days, because Rebbe Meir now said that, um, you know, Rebbe Meir was the one that said, uh, well, actually, Yehuda ben Shemuel didn't add. The story was in the time of Yehuda ben Shemur, he was one of the people that were part of, you know, that, that effected the change in the Roman government's edict. But anyway, it, it's, so it works well. Rabbi Meir says the Megillah Ta'anit retains its status even post-Khorban. Rabbi Yossi Omer, Rabbi Zman, Jebe Yisamitosh Kayana, Shri, Mitnesh, Simcha, Yilahem, when there, and here you get over to the theological statement, no, when there's a Beit HaMikdash, those days retain their status, because they are days of joy. Ein Beit HaMikdash, Mutarim, when there's no Beit HaMikdash, they become permissible <laughs> to have fast days and to eulogize, because it is a day of mourning. So this is an interesting reversal, right? The same way the days of mourning became days of joy, the five fast days in the time of the second Beit HaMikdash, here we're not just saying these days of joy stopped being days of joy post Chorban. We're actually going to the opposite extreme. What used to be days of joy now, beco joy now becomes days of mourning. In a way that's easier to understand than the reverse, right? How now you take Tisha B'Av, which is a day where tragedy, there was a tragedy to the base of Mikdash, a tragedy to the people, lives were lost. How you turn that into a day of rejoicing just because now it's the time of the base of Mikdash is hard to understand. But the reverse is less hard to understand. This was a day of joy because it, you know, because everything worked, was going so well in those days. Now that we're living in a gullus exile, you know, bleak period, to think about those times actually maybe increases the sense of anguish, right? We're remembering how great things used to be and now, at, you know, from our perspective, that increases the degree of loss. So again, quite interesting the way it's going from one extreme to the other. But the basic point is, not that you actually now start fasting on those days, but they do not have their status as minor yuntas. So the Gemara says, v'hilchosa, and the halacha is, baklu, those days are nullified. Now, in the Chorban reality, those days do not have any halachic status. The Hilchasa and the halacha <laughs> is, lo but lo, they did not lose their status. So the Gemara says, Kashi Hilchasa, Hilchasa, we have a problem of two traditions of what the halacha is. Lo Kasha, Kan B'Chanaka, Purim, Kan B'Shar Yome, we've already indicated Chanaka, now we throw in Purim. Chanaka and Purim are days that have, that have lasting significance, maybe because they were entrenched, as the Gemara, as the Gemara said earlier, they were entrenched within society, maybe because of the Pirsim Hanes, the weight of the significance of those days, the fact that they were connected to mitzvot, but those are days that did not get reversed, but every other day got reversed once there was a Chorban Abayas. Yes. Uh, today, uh, 27 Yar, is a day that is listing the Gilatani. Excellent. For what purpose? Uh, we stopped paying tribute to the uh, Greeks. Very nice. The the Great. I had meant to bring in the whole scholarly edition of Megillah Ta'anid. At least maybe, that's from this edition. Right, I found maybe I maybe I, I, I'll bring it in when we learn the sugi because it's a very... The so sugi of Megillah Ta'anid gets repeated in Masechet Ta'anid. Okay, so now I'm let's more, continue.
All right. But um, yeah, uh, I thought this is, it's astounding that this entire discussion um, culminating with Hanukkah and Purim. I mean, Purim has a biblical book. Yes. It's an entire biblical book. Right. Never, in other words, you might think that they would say that's why Purim gets retained. Right. right. Well, the Gemara never actually had to justify Purim get retained. It only had to justify Hanukkah. So you might be right, meaning it could just be that Purim obviously is retained. It's not based on the Gilat Tanit. It's based yeah. on a biblical book. You could be very well could be right. Okay. So now, so we're moving on in the Mishnah. So the first thing we focused on, which got us onto this discussion, is why are they going out for Tishabah but not going out for <laughs> and that led to a whole discussion that the minor fast days, since they don't always apply and so on, the shluchim do not go out for. And that gets to the whole Megillah Tanit about minor fast days, minor holidays, and so on. Back to the Mishnah. The shluchim would go out on Elul in order that people could figure out when Rosh Hashanah is, assuming Elul would only be 29 days, okay? Because obviously you can't go out Rosh Hashanah for Rosh Hashanah, it's too late. The Altishim means Kudamodos, and they go out again on Tishrei to tell people when Tishrei was established, even though people were assuming it was established on day 30 of Elul, but they would go out again just to reinforce that or to, you know, to make it certain that that was the day that it was established, okay, as a backup. So the Gemara says, Kim enough play Elul at Tishrei Lamaluhu. So the Gemara asks the question, I don't get it. You went out on Elul because you could assume Elul was only going to be 29 days. Why do you have to go out again on Tishrei? So the Gemara says, because maybe it's not 100%. It's possible that Elul would be 30 days. So you wanted to go out on Tishrei just to be certain. So the Gemara says, Vama Rebbe Chinin Abarkan, I'm a Rav, I'm a Rav, most Ezra Ve'elech, but one minute, we say that from the time of Ezra onward, Lomatinu Elul Mu'ubar, Elul has never been 30 days. Now, by the way, Tosvah uh, says why we say from the time of Ezra, because if you look closely in the Pesukim of Ezra and you read them, it, it sounds like Elul was 30 days at that time from a certain certain story there. But anyway, mm -hmm. so why would you have to go out again on Rosh Hashanah? We could assume Elul was 29 days. So the Gemara says, no. Lo matzinu lo itzterich. We never found because it was never necessary. Ha itzterich doesn't mean it's impossible. It's happened that way so far. Yeah, okay. If it was necessary, we would do it, we would make it 30 days. Now, what's the Itzterich? So Rashi says it has to do with the fact that, like, you know, when we want Yom Kippur to fall out on, we don't want Yom Kippur and Shabbos to be back to back. Tosa says, you know, no, that's like, um, because that's not tikkun mo'adot in the plural. And anyway, Tosa basically says, it just means if, the witness, if it happened that the witnesses came late, not mm -hmm. Itzterich because of manipulating mm -hmm. calendar mm -hmm. reasons. It means if the circumstances warranted, because the witnesses didn't come on the 30th day, they get right. we, we'd, make, we'd make it 30 days. So the Gemara says, one minute. Ha, Mikalka Rosh Hashanah. One minute. If you're going to make Elul 30 days, you're going to ruin Rosh Hashanah. Now, why are you going to ruin Rosh Hashanah? You're going to ruin Rosh Hashanah because everybody is celebrating Rosh Hashanah on day 30. Everybody is assuming Elul is 29 days. What you should do, this is the way Tosus reads the Gemara, sort of like one of those takanas of the time of Yochan and Zakai about when you accept witnesses, you should refuse to accept witnesses on day 30, you know, that it was a 30-day Elul. You should always just make it a 29-day Elul regardless of what the witnesses say. Because if you allow for the possibility of a 30-day Elul, you'll ruin Rosh Hashanah. People will celebrate Rosh Hashanah assuming it was day 29, and you're now going to make it, you know, assuming Elul was 29 days, and you're now going to make Elul 30 days. But the Riyah, though, is based on an astronomical reality. So that's what's going on, you know, but then there's this issue, which we'll get to, which is, okay, but Basin can always do whatever they want in the end, and they can ignore that. So that's yeah, the that's way Tosus... Really yeah, okay, well, that's the way Tosus is reading it. You know, you shouldn't allow it. You should insist that Elul be 29 days. So the Gemara says, no. Better that Rosh Hashanah should be ruined, not really ruined, but people should have wound up celebrating the wrong day because they were assuming that Elu was 29 days, but we shouldn't ruin the other Moadot, meaning the Moadot should be made in the right time based on when the moon appears, and we're not going to just to, you know, not make it difficult for people, we're not going to not accept the testimony on the new moon. So therefore, although it, it has not yet happened that Elu has been 30 days, it might happen. We're going to allow for that possibility. We're not going to disallow it. And therefore, we need to send out Shluchim on Tishrei because it is always possible it was a 30 day ELO, not a 29 day ELO. Okay, the Gemara says, um, So, yes, that, that can be inferred, this idea that we will accept witnesses 
for um, for Rosh, Rosh Hashanah Tishrei, uh, you know, up through, de, you know, even to allow a 30-day Elo, because it says the witnesses would go out to fix the Moadot. Um, uh, uh, that's a good point, which shows that the idea is Tikkun, fixing the Moadot, means that the Moadot are linked, and that Rosh Chodesh is linked to the actual time the new moon appears, which means that the Moadot are occurring in their right time, based on the actual appearance of the moon, and therefore it is always possible that it was not a 29-day Elul, it was a 30-day Elul, so we send out the Shluchim again, even though it's been very, very rare, we have to allow for that possibility. You know, that language is interestingly ambiguous, because it can mean the opposite. Tikkun Moadot can mean the baiting. Like the manipulation of it, yeah. Exactly. Could be. Okay. <coughs> we just mentioned before Hanukkah and Purim as the two surviving holidays from the uh, pre the rabbinic holidays from the pre korban period, and those get and those we continue and we tend out shluchim so people know when to celebrate. Hanukkah was the one they had the most advance warning for. So the Gemara says, "Yilu nis abra shana yotzim af al adar sheni mitnei purim loktani." One minute, you know what the Mishnah didn't say? Because the Mishnah is listing all the possibilities. Like it says, when there's a base hamikdash, they go out for Pesach sheni. So it should have mentioned another possibility. What's the other possibility? That if it was a Eber year, if it was a leap year, then the fact that they send out witnesses on the first order wouldn't have been enough. They'd have to send out witnesses on the second order, because the second order is when you celebrate Purim. So that didn't say that in the Mishnah. Why not? Masnis in the low Kerebi. It's not like Rebbe. The time we turn to Bray, so Rebbe Omer, in this Abrahashana, if it was a leap year, Yotin Afal Adershani, Neha Purim. You'd go out on Adershani for Purim, because Purim is going to be celebrated in Adershani. Um, you know, you already went out on Adershani, but now it's too late, so you have to go out again on Adershani. So, so, people are already observing in Adershani. Uh, uh, They're going out on Adershani. Right, but that didn't count, according to Rebbe, so you have to go out again on Adershani. So the Gemara now is going to ask. They'd have to have a no, yeah, they'd have to do a second Purim, and you know, even if they celebrated the first one. So that's clearly what Rebbe holds. So now the Gemara is going to try to figure out why, why did our Mishnah not mention, and essentially it'll say what you're implicitly saying. So the Gemara says, "Lema b'hakamifli." Let's say this is the, the debate. The Mar Sarver Kol Mitzvah and Nohegis Pesheni Nohegis Purishon. The author of our Mishnah holds all the Mitzvahs that applied in Adar Sheni applied in Adar Rishon, which doesn't just mean like you got to do it twice, which actually could mean that if you did it in Adar Rishon, you were yotze. So maybe our Mishnah holds you were yotze in Adar Rishon, so they wouldn't bother going out for Adar Sheni. Umar Sarver Kol Mitzvah and Nohegis Pesheni ain't Nohegis Purishon, and Rebbe holds no. The Mitzvahs, even if you even if you did it in Adar Rishon, it doesn't count. They only can be done in Adar Sheni, and therefore you need to go out again for Adar Sheni. So that's the debate whether you would need to celebrate Purim again. Now Tosfos asks a question. Tosfos says, "I don't get it. Even if you don't have to celebrate Purim again, you got to send out shluchim if you made a leap year. Why do you have to kind of send out shluchim if you made a leap year after everybody celebrated Purim? Forget that you're not going to have to do a Purim again. Why do I need to know you made a leap year?" Is, um, you're going to be starting to prepare for Pesach. When is Pesach? I need to know you made a leap year so I know not to make Pesach next month. So Tosha says, yeah, but that you'll figure out because you never heard of, because the Shluchim from, T from Nisan never arrived. So the absence of the Shluchim of Nisan, you know, will be an indication they made it as a leap year. So, which is still pretty That's, funny. You don't want people's basic celebration of Pesach to be so, you know, indeterminate. Okay, but somehow that's what the Gemara is saying. If the Gemara is ignoring the fact that you need to know it was a leap year in order to figure out Pesach, that somehow you figure out. And the only, you know, maybe that message gets across. Oh, basically made a leap year. That you hear. Exactly which day <coughs> did they make Adar Rishon and Adar Shani? 30 days or 29 days? Maybe that you want. Anyway, that's not bothering the Gemara. How you know it was a leap year and there won't be a Pesach? What the Gemara says is, why don't you have to know it's an Adar Shani to do Pesach, to do, to do it a Purim? And maybe the debate is whether you were Yotze Purim with other Rishon. So let's take a look. So the Gemara says, maybe that's the debate. The Gemara says, well, not necessarily. We could say everybody agrees that what you did in other Rishon didn't count. So if it didn't count, why don't you have to go out for other Rishon so people know when to celebrate Purim? The debate is about the how, how much you would add when you made it in Rishon. What does that mean? Titan, Titan Brisa. Kamer Iber Shana. How much would you add for the Iber Shana? Lamagyo. It would always be a 30 days. Okay? So, um, so, one minute. So, I just want to look one thing in Tosos, uh, in Rashi. No, so excuse me. Right, how much would other, it's a little funny, because you're like, con conceptually, you're adding other shame. 
But since Adr Shani, it has the status of the real Adr, because Adr Shani is when you celebrate Purim, what winds up being the case is which year do you get conceptualized as the leap month? Which mm -hmm. month is Adr Risha, right? It's a little bit ironic. Yeah. Conceptually, you're adding an extra Adr before Nisan comes about, but since that second Adr gets the status of the real Adr, the leap month conceptually is Adr Risha. Okay, so this is the question of how long is Adarisha? How many days is the leap month that you are going to add? Maybe it's fixed, maybe it's just as determinate as every other month on the moon. Let's take a look. Kama Ibershana, how many how big is that month that you've added? Lamid Yom, always 30 days. Once you're adjusting the calendar, might as well maximally adjust it and make it 30 <laughs> days. But Shim Gamliel Omar Chodesh. A month, which means Yes, but presumably a month in contrast to 30 days means 29, 29 days. days. So the Gemara says, my so anyway, um, so the Gemara says that's the debate. So the point is, we don't have to send out shluchim for Adar Shani, because again, presumably people will know that it was a leap year. How we can assume that people will know it's a leap year is not clear. Okay, that they'll get word of. So the only reason we would need shluchim would be to, if they want to know the precise day. Was the pre, what, did the second Adar start on day 30 or on day 31? So the Gemara says, maybe that's a debate. One opinion says that the it will always start on day 31. Adar Risha will always be 30 days. So you don't need Shluchim. People can figure out when Rosh Chodesh Adar Shani is. And the others say, no, it'll be Chodesh. So the Gemara assumes Chodesh is 29 days. So it says, okay, so it's also a fixed amount. So the Gemara says, uh, where were we? Did they make uh, announcements in shul? Like it's a I don't know. So the Gemara says like this. So... So the Gemara says, Mashna Lamid Yidi. So you say that it was 30 days. They didn't need to send Shluchim because they would have known that the other region was 30 days. They would have known when other Shani began. <laughs> so Chodesh Namidi. So if Chodesh means 29 days, they also would have known when other Shani began. We're back to square one. Why do you need Shluchim for other Shani, assuming people know that it's a leap year? So the Gemara says, Amara, Papa, Mandamar Chodesh. No, Chodesh does not mean 29 days. If you say Chodesh, it means Ratza Chodesh, Ratza Shloshim. It could be 29 or 30. It's a ver it's there's no fixed size for other Rishon. So what has the Gemara said now? The Gemara has said that. Would you send out Shluchim for Adar Shani? It could be everybody agrees you need to know Adar Shani in order to make Purim. But would you send out Shluchim? So the Gemara is assuming that everybody also knows whether it's a leap. So the debate whether you send our shluchim is just a debate of do can you can you without the shluchim figure out when Adar Shani began, assuming you know it was a leap year. So if you say it's always a fixed size of Adar Rishon, 30 days, then you don't need the shluchim. You know it's a leap year, you'll know when Adar Shani begins. It begins on the 31st of Adar Rishon, the day after day 30. If you say, however, the size of Adar Rishon varies, then you're going to need shluchim even if you know it's a leap year, because you still need to know exactly what day Adar Shani began so that you can properly celebrate Purim. Okay, so now the Gemara continues. Um, okay. Um, hey, Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi, Mishum Kila Kedisha Jerusalem. We've had that a couple of times. Kila Kedisha Jerusalem. I have no idea. The holy community of Jerusalem. Um, Al Shnei Adarim. When you have two Adars, Shemekatin Osam Biyom Iburehem. That you sanctify them on the day of their pregnancy, meaning day thirty. So that the other other Rishon is 29 days and other Shani is 29 days. The new moon begins on the pregnant day, the extra day, on day 30. So both others are 29 days. So the Gemara says, Lameimra, this says, the Chaserin Avidan, Meleim Lo Avdinan, that we only do. So 29 day other is not 30 days. Before we had an opinion that Dafka we do 30 days. Here it's saying we Dafka do 29 days. So the Gemara says, La midarish of Nachim Barchista. But this is an opinion that's a third opinion. One opinion said other Rishon could be 29 or 30. One said always 30. This opinion says always not only other Rishon, but other Rishon and other Shani only 29. And that is to reject the position of Rav Nachim Barchista. If you look at the side, it adds the words, Didarish Rav Nachim Barchista, Rav Nachim Barchista explicated. Hey, Rebbe Simai, Mishum Chagai Zechari Malachi. Rebbe Simai testified quite fascinating in the name of the three Nevi'im, Chagai Zechari Malachi, that were there the, in the building of the second Beit HaMikdash. So there's a few years between those two. <laughs> anyway, between Chagai Zechari Malachi and Rav Simai. Anyway, he testified a tradition going back all the way to them. Al Shnei Adarim, on two Adar, Shim Ratzul Asot, and Shnei Amalaim Osim. You can make them both full. Shneim chaserim osim. You can make them both twenty-nine days. Echad mali bechad chaser osim. You can make one full and one chaser. Okay, you can do whatever you want. Okay, so as opposed to now we have a range of opinions. One says it always varies. One says it's always twenty-nine days. The other says it's always thirty days. Okay. 
And that was the practice that they used to do in the exile before they returned to the second Beit HaMikdash to have a lot of variation in terms of the size of the Adars. And the name of our master, they said, okay, so Gemara says, Rashi says that that's Rav. It's always one full and one lacking in that order, meaning Adar Shani is, Adar Rishon is always 30 days, Adar Shani is always 29. Unless you have an explicit testimony that the um, that the uh, that the other Shani was um, in its time, in its time always means the previous month was a 29 day month. So we basically assume a 30 day Adar Rishon, a 29 day Adar Shani, unless you have concrete knowledge that they made the Adar Rishon a 29 days, okay? So you're going to be tested on all these opinions mm. <laughs> later. The upshot, of course, being that there's a whole range of opinions whether Adar Rishon has to be 29 days, has to be 30 days, or is a variant. Okay. Anyway, but again, do you need Shluchim to go out for Adar Shani? Assuming that pe- we can assume that people know it's a leap year, do you, whether you need Shluchim or not for Adar Shani depends on whether you can all have a, if Adar Rishon is always a fixed number of days, you don't need Shluchim for Adar Shani. If it's a variant number of days, you do need Shluchim. Let's look at one more line. Look at that, we caught up. So, Shalchulei Lamar Ukva, they sent to Mar Ukva the following question. Other samach lenisan leolam chaser. I'm not the question. Actually, the statement that they, they sent the message that if the other that is near Nisan, meaning if it's other sheni or if it's not a leap year, but the other immediately preceding Nisan is always 29 days, which fits into that statement in the name of Rav that it's 30 and 29. The one before Nisan is always 29 days. Okay. Um, so now the Gemara says like this: Masif of Nachman. Rav Nachman asked on this. Ashnei chadashim mechalim es Shabbat. You would violate Shabbat to come testify. We're going to see this later that the witnesses could break Shabbat to come to the Beit Hamikdash to testify about two months. Al Nisan Val Tishrei, Al Nisan and Tishrei, because those are the months that you really had to establish in the right time, because those would determine when the Yomim Tovim would be. What was our few yeah, or if you had to just, yeah, tchum or carrying, if you had to carry an old person who saw it and couldn't do the walking himself. Okay, so you can actually biblically violate Shabbat to come and testify on the new moon, on, on those two months. We'll see that. It's a later Mishnah. I get if Adar, the Adar before Nisan could vary, so you have to violate because... You don't, you, need, you, you don't know how long Adar is going to be, and you need to establish it in its right time, okay? Because obviously if you're coming for Nisan, it means that you are testifying. That's when Adar, the Adar ends and Nisan begins. So if the Adar always ends on a fixed number of days, on 29 days, why would you be able to violate Shabbat? You know when Nisan is going to begin. Ela'iya Marta, top of Chaf Amad Aleph, if you say, La'olam chaser, that other is always 29 days, so you know without the witnesses when Nisan will begin. So am I mechalin? Why would you violate? Somebody says, no. Nah. That even if you know what day it's going to be, but and even if somehow you've manipulated it that it's going to be that day, there's a mitzvah to do it based on testimony, and that mitzvah, even if it, the calendar is not dependent on it, that mitzvah would tell you you can violate Shabbat. We'll just read one other version of that. We also taught. So now it's going to be used the opposite way. If you say, there's always 29 days, then I get why you violate Shabbat for Nisan. That's a little ironic. Why? Because it's already assuming the answer. The mitzvah of Kadesh because there's a mitzvah to do it based on the testimony, and that would be enough, even though we know when the date would be. But if you don't know whether it's going to be 29 or 30 days, okay, why would you violate? Why don't we just assume it's going to be a 30-day month and sanctify the following day? Okay, so exactly what that means. Oh, I forgot it's Tuesday, so we really have to end. Okay, so we will see tomorrow why the Gemara assumes that you can use that evidence to prove the exact opposite. Okay, so we pick up with that tomorrow, whether other is always 29 days or whether it varies. Joe, happy birthday. You're 90 years old today. Wow. That's, happy birthday. Happy birthday.